And all righty, take out your Bibles or your devices. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 12. And I know you probably thought, well, today's Palm Sunday. We got to preach on Palm Sunday. So she's going to, Pastor Wendy's going to get away from her message, Jesus said. No, I'm not. I just worked it in. <laughs> so Jesus said, another one in our series today. And this one is called, Jesus said, how I wish you would understand. How I wish you would understand. And we're going to be reading um, back a few chapters in John chapter 12. We're going to start with verse 12. But before we get there, let's just talk a little bit. Well, today is Palm Sunday, right? And usually I get some palms and put them out. I didn't, it just snuck up on me this year. And so there's no palms around um, but it's a day that we commemorate Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey while all the people waved their palm branches, and it was a sign of celebration and acknowledgement of him as the Messiah. They were celebrating, yes, he is our Messiah. And, um, and they waved, the, you know, if you go back in, I think it's Leviticus, they used palm branches back then, and it was, it was they used them for celebration. And to, you know, glorify God. And so they just brought that into Jesus' day too. Well, that event took place, that Palm Sunday took place a few days before Jesus actually went to the cross and died a horrible death as the ultimate sacrifice for all of mankind. And we've been looking over the past few weeks, we've been looking at specific things that Jesus has said to his disciples after their last supper together, found in the 14th chapter of the book of John. But today we're going to go back a few chapters to chapter 12 and look at how Palm Sunday came about and another specific thing that Jesus had to say. So if you're in John 12, let's start in verse 12. It says, the next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look. Your king is coming riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that, he, that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Let's pray over his word. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would make this word come to life to us, to each one of us today. That we would see this Palm Sunday and all and these events that took place thousands of years ago in a different light with a different set of eyes. And that by seeing it from your perspective, that our walk with you would just go deeper and deeper. We love you. We praise you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, when Jesus traveled the road to Jerusalem on the back of a donkey... He, was try he wasn't just trying to glorify himself. He had a purpose and a plan in mind. I mean, if you think back from the time I was young, we heard about Palm Sunday. We heard about the palm branches. We heard that Jesus sat on the bank, back of a donkey. You know, and I don't know that I gave it a whole lot of thought of what the real meaning was behind all of it. We just think, well, you know, he's the Messiah and he... Like a parade, a single parade. He rode in on a town, and everybody lined the streets, and they were watching, and, and they were, you know, cheering him on, singing praises to him. And we think, well, 
He must have just been trying to glorify himself, put him up on this pedestal. But I'm here to say that there was, there was so much more to it. And so we're going to dive into what some deeper meanings are um, for his ride into Jerusalem. So for Jesus, the road to Jerusalem was a road where many things were accomplished. And there are three things that I'd like to share with you that were accomplished on Jesus' ride into Jerusalem. So the first one, the road to Jerusalem was a road of revelation. You might say, okay, what does that mean? The road to Jerusalem was a road of revelation. Well, his ride on that donkey into Jerusalem revealed many things. It revealed the fact that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God. It also revealed the fact that he was a fulfillment of prophecy. I love prophecy. I don't know if you get into it at all, if you'll read some of the Old Testament and, and he, read about the prophecies and see how they all came true down to the smallest detail. Well, one of them is found in Zechariah, the book of Zechariah. And Zechariah wrote the book of Zechariah. (laughs) And he prophesied to the Jewish people. It was around 480 B.C. And the Jewish people had just returned to Jerusalem from Babylon. They had been captured, and they spent a long time in Babylon. They're returning to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And they were really facing a lot of opposition as they were trying to rebuild this temple. And so here was the prophet Zechariah. And in Zechariah 9.9, this is what he said. He spoke words of encouragement to the people as he said this. It says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So we're talking 480 B.C., hundreds of years, hundreds of years before Jesus comes riding down this road into Jerusalem on a donkey. The very words that Zechariah spoke to the people came true. And at the time, Zechariah was trying to encourage the people, but he was speaking words straight from God. That's what prophecy is. Words straight from God that are going to tell you about the future. So Zechariah was speaking of things in the future, but he was trying to encourage the people and cause them to see the big picture, which was this. He's saying, yes, Things may seem really bad and rough and hard right now, but take heart. Take heart because the Messiah is coming and he will make all things new. And so when God gave Zechariah this prophetic word, he gave him details about what was going to happen, that he was going to send the Messiah. And not only was he going to send him, but he was going to come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey during Passover. And that the people would stand along the side of the road proclaiming the exact same words that came out of Zechariah's mouth. Praise God. Hail to the king of Israel, of Jerusalem. That's not an accident. That's not a coincidence. That's how God works. God knows what's going on in this world. And he also knows what's going on in individual lives. He knows what's going on in your life, in my life. And he doesn't just care. Like, he really cares about us. But he gives us prophetic words. He tells us about things in the future. He doesn't surprise us. He lets us know. And a lot of times we can't decipher it. But then after things happen, we can go back and say, wow, that was God. See, God always reveals things ahead of time. And he reveals them ahead of time through people known as prophets and, he, and through his word. If you would pick up his word and read it, there's so many things in there that tell us 
what's going to happen? A lot of those prophecies have come true, but some have yet to come true. And because a long period of time has gone by, many people say, well, it's not going to happen. Lord's not going to come back. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. God said it. It's going to happen. See, there's many prophecies throughout the whole Old Testament that predict right down to the smallest detail the coming of the Messiah. And this that I just read to you out of Zechariah is just one of those examples spoken about the Messiah riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And see, that's not a coincidence either. Riding into Jerusalem on a donkey was a sign of humility. If you look it up, um, normally kings would ride into town. They wanted to conquer an area, conquer a town. They'd ride in on a horse. So if you rode in on a horse, that meant that you were a conquering king. You, you've come in to conquer. You ride in on a donkey, <laughs> it's kind of a sign of humility and, and peace. And Jesus, it, again, it wasn't a coincidence. He knew that's the way he was supposed to come in because he needed to fulfill that prophetic word. <laughs> so this spoke of the fact that Jesus was riding in as a ruling king of a different kingdom, <laughs> a heavenly kingdom. If he had ridden in on a horse, then that meant that he would... He was riding in to conquer that country, that town, that area, and rule on the earth. But he's like, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm a conquering king, but of a different kingdom. Most people thought he was going to overcome and conquer the physical kingdom of Rome and then go on to become the new king of their country and of the Jewish people. But they were wrong. Because they only saw with earthly eyes. They didn't see things from an eternal perspective, from a heavenly, spiritual perspective. They wanted, you know, they're living in a, they were living in a very harsh time. They were being ruled by Rome. And there were many things that they could and couldn't do. And so they wanted Jesus to come in, the Messiah to come in and conquer the Roman people. Retake their land. And now they would have him as their king, as their high priest. But he's like, no, I didn't come in because this life is going to end. <laughs> this is just temporary. So he was trying to make that point that he definitely is a king. But he's the king of all kings. <laughs> Praise God. The crazy thing is even his disciples who had spent the last three years with him, they didn't understand that he was fulfilling prophecy by doing this. We just read it in verse 16, but I want to repeat it again. It says, Af but after Jesus entered into his glory, after he ascended into heaven, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. They didn't realize it at the time. You see, the disciples were brought up as students of the Old Testament word. That's just Jewish boys were brought up that way. You knew. You studied the whole, you know, Old Testament, what there was at that time. And they knew the words of Zechariah. But it didn't come back to them until after Jesus entered into glory. Then they were like, Oh, my goodness, he fulfilled prophecy. So you see, Jesus, in every way possible, was trying to reveal his identity to everyone. Think about that. He came to earth as a baby, and he spent the next 33 years, well, three of those 33 years, really trying to reveal who he was to everyone around him, that he was the Messiah. And he did this through signs and wonders. He did this through spoken word. He, he called himself son of man. You know, he, he called himself many things to reveal to the people that he was the Messiah. He did this through God speaking from heaven 
a few times, this is my son in who I am well pleased. (laughs) He did this through the fulfillment of prophecy. He was given everyone the opportunity to believe that he was the Messiah. And I'm sure he went around thinking, what more do I need to do to make you believe? I've done signs and wonders. I've spoken to you. I've, you know, God, you've heard my father speak from heaven. I'm doing things that are fulfilling prophecy right before your eyes. What more do you need? So his ride into Jerusalem that day wasn't his attempt to feed his own ego. It was an attempt to prove one last time before his death who he really was. That's powerful to me, and many missed it. The second thing, the road to Jerusalem was a road of reflection. You see, this was the final hoorah of a long three-year revelation process and ministry for Jesus. It was coming to a close. Jesus had touched many lives over that time period. Many lives he had touched. He accomplished many miraculous things that were either witnessed physically by people or by, um, by the word of mouth as it spread throughout the area or throughout the countryside. And that was a big deal. Again, they didn't have (laughs) internet, phones, text messaging. It was word of mouth. And people would say, do you know what happened in that town the other day? This man that was blind got his sight back. This man that was lame got up and ran. And it spread. I mean, that was... There were no newspapers, so, you know, you tried to find excitement during that time. (laughs) Most people of that day heard or witnessed the things that this man named Jesus either did or spoke for the past three years. They were hearing about it, or they had witnessed it. And many of them, many of them were wondering and strongly considering the possibility that Jesus truly was the Messiah. Could this carpenter's son really be the Messiah? How could he do these things? He has to be somebody special. So they were considering this over this three-year time period. And as Jesus rode in on that donkey, this was their final opportunity to reflect over everything and consider the possibility and make a decision one way or the other. Proof of the fact that they were reflecting is found in verses 17 and 18 of John 12 that we read, but I want to reread it. It says, many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. I would too if somebody rose somebody from the dead. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. You see, it wasn't too long before this that Jesus went in and prayed for Lazarus, and he came walking out of that tomb, a dead man. Three days? Was he three days or four days? Four? I can't remember. I think it is four days. Hmm. That's a miraculous thing. And it just had happened not long before before this uh, Palm Sunday. And Jesus didn't do that miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead just to appease a grieving family. (laughs) How do I know that? Well, turn back to John 11, just one chapter. Just one chapter back. Jesus rose called Lazarus from the dead to reveal who he was. Starting in verse 40 of John 11, it says, Jesus responded to the crowd that was standing around the tomb. I'm adding some things here. He's standing around the tomb where Lazarus is, is buried. And so Jesus responds to all these people, and he says, Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory? 
if you believe. So they rolled the stone away. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe what? That you sent me. (laughs) I love that. Yes, he, he, Jesus loved Lazarus. He loved Mary and Martha, his sisters. And of course, they were grieving because their brother had died. And I'm sure that pulled and tugged at his heartstrings. But his whole reason wasn't just to appease a grieving family. His whole reason for calling Lazarus from the dead was so that people would believe that God sent him as the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? So Jesus' road, in, he, the road to enter Jerusalem was his final way for everyone to reflect on who he was and for them to make a final decision for themselves of whether they were going to believe in him or not. The last point that I have, Jesus, the road to Jerusalem was also a road of rejection. So it was a road of revelation, a road of reflection, and last, a road of rejection. So even though Jesus was giving all the people the opportunity to accept and believe in him, this final ride in Jerusalem for Jesus was a ride of rejection. And he knew it. He knew it. Sure, it looked and sounded like they were all accepting him and believing him at the time, but it was pretty short-lived. I mean, we already read in verse 13 of chapter 12 in John where the people were cheering and they were saying, Praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. This is what they were proclaiming and shouting from the streets. So it looked good. It looked great. It looked like they were accepting him. But just a few days later, some of those same people were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. How do you go from one to the other so quickly? See, in Luke, I'm going to take you into the book of Luke because the story is found in both Luke and John, the story of Palm Sunday. Luke gives a little bit of a different or a little more details to this Palm Sunday story in Luke 19. If you want to turn there, they're going to put it up on the screen too. Luke 19, starting in verse 41. I'm not going to read the whole story to you. I just... These these two verses are really, they stuck out to me. And it gives us a bit more detail of what Jesus was feeling and what he was thinking as he began his entrance into Jerusalem. Verse 41 says this, But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead of him, he began to weep. And he said these words, How I wish... Today, that you of all people, meaning the Jewish people, would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. He knew he was going to be rejected. He knew that the people, even though they were cheering, that they really, really didn't believe. He knew what lay ahead of him. He knew he would be rejected by the masses, his own people, his own people. And yet he still presented one last opportunity to them. He gave them one last try, one last shot. Are you going to believe in me? You see, that's what's called grace and mercy. Even though he knew, he's like, I'm going to give you one more opportunity. He also knew who would and who wouldn't accept him. 
And there came a point where he hid himself from them. See, God gives everybody the opportunity. But he also is God. So he knows, he knows who will accept him and who won't. And at some point, there's that line is drawn. And he kind of removes himself, hides himself from them. How do I know that? Because he says it's too late. Peace is hidden from your eyes. Their own hearts are cold. So he kind of removes himself, his Holy Spirit, from them. Grieves them because he wishes that all would be saved, that all would recognize who he is. 